Your Legislators is made possible by Minnesota Corn. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in value-added products, Minnesota Corn Farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at MFU.org. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. My name is Barry Anderson. I'll be your host this evening and all the weeks that follow as we interview your legislators and give you, the viewer, an opportunity to have a conversation with the men and women who represent you in St. Paul. As always, this is your program and we want to invite you to call in with your questions or to send them to us via the various electronic means that will appear on the bottom of your screen and we will see that your questions get to our panel. We do also want to remind you that the Minnesota Channel has a nightly program on affairs at the legislature, and we invite you to turn on that program for daily updates on what's taking place at the legislature. Now, we begin this week, as we do each week, by giving our guests an opportunity to introduce themselves. We're going to begin with Senator Steve Swadzinski uh, from District 49 in Eden Prairie. Uh, Senator, if you'd be so kind as to tell our viewers a little bit about your history, your background, uh, and uh, committees you serve on, and um, uh, anything else that you think you need to introduce yourself to our viewers. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, so I taught American government and American history for 33 years in Eden Prairie, Minnesota at the high school. And um, I retired in 2016, and um, I, um, I wasn't ready to full on retire, so I, decided to run for state senate and I, I was successful and I got elected um, by the people of Eden Prairie and Minnetonk and um, I've loved every minute of it ever since. It's a great place um, as the other three people will testify to. It's a, a great gig um, to represent the people of Minnesota and the committees I serve on are um, elections, uh, education policy, education finance, um, state and local government and veterans, and um, lastly, what is, oh, elections. So those are the committees I'm on, and they keep, they, it keeps me busy, and I get to serve with um, Senator Rarick on one of those four committees. So thanks. Looking forward to tonight. All right, very good. We're delighted to have you with us. Let's go to Senator Jason Rarick from Pine City, District 11. Senator Rarick, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me tonight and uh, again, Barry. Um, so outside of the legislature, I'm an electrician. Uh, been doing that since 1992, and since uh, 2004, I've been on my own as a, a one-man electrical contractor. Uh, you know, I grew up in Pine City. I bought my grandparents' place. You know, my son is fifth generation to have lived there. So, you know, it's been great staying in my hometown, and and then being. Uh, in 2014, I ran for the legislature for the first time, served four years in the House, and then in a special election, uh, moved over to the Senate and uh, starting my fifth year now in the Senate. And, and I would agree, it's it's quite an honor to serve the people of your area and the people of the state in the legislature. And uh, so I've typically served in uh, jobs and labor, uh, and this is the first year that I'm not on either one of those. Um, I am still on energy. Uh, I'm on higher education, and then I am on education finance with Senator Swadzinski. So that is a brand new one for me, and uh, it's a, a lot to learn in a short period of time, but uh, it, it's a great committee to be on. We'll probably have an opportunity to talk about energy-related issues. We always get questions on that topic, and uh, before the hour's done, I suspect we'll have a chance to have a conversation about uh, those and related issues. Also joining us from... Uh, uh, District uh, 39B in New Brighton, Representative Sandra Feist. Uh, Representative Feist, tell, us, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my district is in the North Metro. It's the southern part of New Brighton, St. Anthony and Columbia Heights. Um, I was first elected in 2020, so I'm in my second term. Um, when I'm not in the legislature, I am an immigration attorney. I have my own law practice, and I also teach immigration law as an adjunct at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Um, I am the vice chair of the Public Safety Committee, um, which I serve on with Representative Mueller. Um, I am also on the Education Finance Committee, the Judiciary Committee, um, where I get to also be my lawyer nerd um, self, and um, the um, Economic Development Committee as well. Um, also, I'm the DFL House Lead on something called Civility Caucus, which is a bipartisan, bicameral uh, group of legislators that try to just build effective working relationships across the aisle and across bodies. Um, so very excited to be here with you all tonight. Thank you. Uh, we're delighted to have you. Before the program began, we were having a little conversation about civic education, and Representative Feist and I have the privilege of uh, having some background with a couple of those programs and uh, doing some work in that space. And of course, uh, Senator Swadzinski actually taught in that space. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll have an opportunity to touch on some of that uh, this evening as well. Last but certainly not least, joining us from District uh, 23B in Austin, Representative uh, Mueller, Representative Patricia Mueller. Representative Mueller, tell, us, uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, great. Thank you so much for having me as the first time being on uh, this show tonight. And so it's quite an honor to be able to be here. Representative Patricia Mueller from Austin, Minnesota, and then uh, 23B surrounding areas of some of our, our rural area of uh, uh, Lyle and Grand Meadow and Brownsdale, uh, Blooming Prairie, and so some really great areas that I'm really proud to represent. Um, I was a teacher for almost 20 years. I've taught um, a lot of different places, but I taught uh, English education for uh, eighth and 10th grade for several years. Um, I also was a teacher in China for three years and taught in Indiana for a little while, teaching all over the place with, with English. Um, I went on to with my degree to get my master's in curriculum instruction with an emphasis in literacy. And then just this past May, I just completed my doctorate in education leadership. And so kind of hoping to be able to transition from teaching in the K-12 system to hopefully being able to teach in the college system in the future. Um, I am on public safety. I was elected in 2020 and um, was, so this is my second term, came in with the same time as Representative Vice, and um, I'm in public safety and on education policy. I was on education finance, but because of scheduling area er, uh, <clears throat> things, I wasn't able to be on both. So I'm on those two committees for this time and really excited about our conversation. So Representative Mueller, um... I know that you've had me um, important responsibilities, you've been teaching uh, students in a variety of places who've gone on to do great things. I just want you to know that I was talking to a professor um, at Stanford uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was explaining to him that Austin, Minnesota is famous for many things, um, including the Spam Museum. And uh, he did not believe me that there was such a thing as the Spam Museum, and he really did believe me when I explained to him it's really worth seeing. And I had to send him proof of the existence of the Spam Museum, and I'm sure I don't need to. Uh, I don't uh, need to plug the Spam Museum. The representative from Austin can do that. But I just want to let you know that your uh, hometown came in for some attention. Yes, uh, definitely worth a visit, and it's free to visit. So feel free to come on down. There you go. All right, well, let's move on to the news of the day, which uh, no doubt there are a variety of things occurring at the legislature. One of the topics that we've had some discussion about in preceding weeks uh, it, it was the question of uh, what, whether there would be a bonding bill and what would happen to the bonding bill. Uh, and so uh, I think um, uh, there was some action on that in the Senate floor today. I don't think it's the last chapter in that discussion. Let's start with you, Senator Rarick. I think you might be our veteran legislator here today. Uh, we'll give you the first go at it, um, talk a little bit about the bonding bill, and then we'll go to our senators and finish up with Representative Mueller. The uh, floor is yours. Tell our viewers what happened with the bonding bill and what happens next. Yeah, well, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, Senate Republicans have said all along we're in full support of a bonding bill, but we want it to come with tax relief. And uh, we had some of that discussion today, 
and um, offered an amendment to, to bring the Social Security tax uh, cut, uh, and have that be part of it. You know, that's kind of been our number one. A lot of people are, are for that. And, you know, didn't come to agreement there. Uh, the, the vote didn't, you know, take 60 percent, um, didn't get the 60 percent vote needed in the Senate to pass it. Um, I am very happy that it was brought up back for reconsideration and then tabled. So uh, the, the bill is not dead. We are able to continue our conversations and, and I'm hoping we will we will be doing that. And Senators Wazinski, your thoughts on the uh, bonding bill? Yeah, it was uh, it was I think Jason would agree it was a spirited debate today. Um, it was pr pretty um, interesting as as he pointed out it takes three fifths. It's one of the few things at the Senate that isn't simple majority and uh, so we didn't get the three fifths and uh, so the bonding bill, um, kind of died today for now. Uh, and as um, Jason pointed out, the Republicans wanted to tie it in with Social Security tax cuts, and we were less than enthusiastic to want to do that. We'd like to have two separate bills follow, come through. And um, and then another interesting top uh, pers point of view on the bonding is uh, some people don't feel like we should be borrowing money with the surplus. And so I think what we're going to try to do as uh, Democrats in the Senate is have a, a bonding bill that is um, you know, borrowed and then a, 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 a cash, so to speak, bonding bill. So we might have two different bonding bills come out of this session. Representative Feist, your thoughts? Uh, obviously, uh, um, to some extent, uh, the House is a spectator to this conversation because it's mm -hmm. occurring in the Senate. But, uh, but of course, the the uh, bill did originate there, and uh, maybe you could tell our viewers a little bit about uh, your thoughts on the bonding bill. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the House did our part, um, and we actually did pass the GO and the cash bonding bills separately in the House. Um, I am very excited by the bills that we passed. They were really um, just important investments in infrastructure um, and really um, spread out across the state of Minnesota. Um, there's a reason that we were able to pass it with a supermajority um, in the House. Um, I know that, you know, for my district, the um, Southern Anoka County Food Shelf, SACA Food Shelf, um, one of the organizations that was going to receive funding um, in the House bill. And, you know, it's projects like that that are really serving the community in a regional way, in a really robust way, um, that are like the perfect um, types of investments that we should be making. So I, I'm excited about the House bonding bill. Um, we're, we're looking at you, Senate, um, to, to take it home. Representative Mueller. Yeah, so you've heard several of the comments um, made from uh, my colleagues here and um, there was some there is a lot of talk about with a um, billions of dollars of surplus why do we need to be borrowing any money um, i was one of the um, legislators from the minority party that did vote for the bonding bill and um, one of the reasons is that i don't consider this as a as a supplemental bonding bill this was the framework that was negotiated in 2022 and should have been passed in 2022. Um, for the first time in 10 years, Austin Wastewater Treatment Plant was included in that. And that was a, um, a ask that had been uh, been continually brought before the our legislators for over a decade. And for, this is the first time it finally was in. And so I had told my uh, community back in 22 that I wanted to vote on it. The majority party didn't bring it to the table. And so which there are lots of reasons and I'm not going to go in there, but it's one of those things where we didn't get a chance to vote on it in 22. So I've always considered this as the 22 bonding bill. And I had given my community my um, my support back at that point, And I couldn't understand uh, changing it just because we wanted to use it as leverage. I understand what the Senate is doing and I know why they're doing it. For me, this was something that was very personal and I wanted to make sure that I was upholding the promises I made to my community. All right, we've had a question from a viewer in Stearns County who wants to talk about uh, nursing home uh, expenses and uh, reimbursement rates, which the viewer regards as late and often inadequate. Uh, and uh, uh, 
this viewer uh, has some experience in, in uh, serving as a volunteer uh, on uh, one of these nursing home boards and wants to know what the uh, plan of action is for, for this in this legislative session. Let's go to you, Senator uh, Swadzinski. Let's start with you. Um, nursing home um, issues. Well, it's part of a larger discussion about health care expenses, I'm sure, but, but this viewer is concerned about nursing homes. Let's start there. Well, um, this has hit close to home for me. Um, we had to put my mom in uh, um, a nursing home um, in a, 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 a secured unit in August at the height of the campaign. And um, she's an only child and I'm an only child. So it's just her and I. So all the things that um, I've heard about um, nursing homes, like shortages and improper pay and lack of um, staffing. I said that and um, and just who, how to pay for all this stuff. And um, we, we had to sell my mother's house um, to pay the bills and it's $10,000 a month um, to, to, for her care. And it's just, it, it's crazy and it's only going to get worse. Um, this is something that's going to get better. And I'm just, I, this is all new to me, but boy, my learning curve in the last four or five months has been very steep. And I'm anxious to hear from the leaders in the Senate and the House that have a lot more wisdom and experience than I. But I, I'm full on board for whatever ideas that are come forward because, like I said, um, the last five years have been a, 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 um, a nightmare for, our, for my family and uh, because of my mom mom and um so anyways I'm, I'm anxious to hear what the other three have to say for solutions that maybe um they've been out at this for a lot longer than i have representative feist your thoughts yeah so i've definitely received a lot of emails from constituents about just the waiver reimbursement rates um i know that that's something that there's a large consensus around um raising those rates um, there are other things that we're looking at to ensure kind of nursing home um, high level of care for our loved ones. Um, today in the Judiciary Committee, we heard a um, bill that would create like an advisory board um, to create some more accountability and oversight um, within the nursing home industry. Um, Today, I also presented a bill to address the fact that Minnesota is the only state in the entire country where if you die, a lawsuit um, dies with you. Um, and so we um, heard from a lot of folks who had had relatives who were in care facilities who had um, really suffered some egregious abuse. Um, and, and basically, there's an incentive right now for care facilities, insurance companies, hospitals to draw out those claims, um, waiting for people to pass away. And so we're going to change that this year. It's a bipartisan bill. It's really common sense. Um, and it's something that can just make sure that, it, you know, we want our nursing homes to be well staffed and a safe and supportive environment for our family, our loved ones. Um, and this is just going to ensure that when they don't um, rise to that high standard that we have a right to expect, um, that, that they will be held accountable. Um, so so I, that's, Bill's been a long time coming and I'm really proud to carry it. Representative Mueller. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think I, I look at this a couple different ways. And so um, I like many of my colleagues here, I have received several emails and several people have come to my um, office to talk to me about the dire need that we have for um, for workers in our nursing homes. And, and uh, you know, their salary is um, legislated. That's something that we have to be, that we as a legislature have to be able to uh, raise and that's something we definitely they're trying to be able to be competitive and they're unable to do that because of barriers that we are that we are putting up and so that's something we have to be able to acknowledge and and uh, compensate for but the other thing that i look at remember i'm an educator and so i think about how do we get more people into this field and how do we um, get people get the pipeline built back up um there is been a lot of going, things going on that may deter people from becoming, uh, coming into uh, uh, nursing homes to work. And so I have looked at how we could have apprenticeship opportunities that would be appropriate for older high school students. Also looking at how we can have apprenticeship or in, um, residency programs that would be able to um, supply a certification program so that when a, a a student graduates from high school, they actually have dual credits that they've already completed that um, 
would then once I graduated with the local college or, or um, uh, community college, that once they graduate from that, they're actually able to be ready to be hired right away and, and be able to be right there in that, um, in that position. And so this is something that I think is really um, that we need to be looking at from all other angles. You know, we, we often think about how much money we need to spend in an issue, and I'm not saying that we don't, but I also want to make sure that we are looking structurally how we are going to get more people into the into the workforce. Representative Rarick, your thoughts on the uh, nursing home issues? Yeah, you know, this isn't an area that I typically uh, deal in. It's never been a committee area I've uh, served on, but you know, we we all hear uh, from folks who with family members and and from the facilities and the workers and. You know, both the reimbursement rates for the facilities and the pay for the workers are, are both way behind where they need to be. Uh, you know, the stories that we hear over and over, you know, uh, we're losing the workers in those places to the hospitals uh, just because they can make more money. And so these, these are things that we have to be able to address um, this year. Uh, otherwise, you know, you know, I hear over and over people who are in hospitals cannot get discharged. There's no beds available or, and it's not because the beds aren't there. It's because the staff isn't there uh, to be able to have these facilities, be able to have as many patients as they could handle. So, you know, staffing is definitely an issue. The workforce development in so many sectors, but, you know, this is, this is a big one. Uh, just in higher mm -hmm. education today, we heard uh, some testimony around workforce development. You know, um, the numbers, uh, I believe they said like 30,000 people are going to be turning 80 over the next three years. And so, you know, this is just, you know, there's, they're losing workers, but the demand is growing. So definitely something we have to have conversations and figure out uh, very, very soon. Representative Mueller, let's move to a different topic, which is uh, post-secondary education. Um, we have had some uh, questions from viewers about that, that general topic. Uh, and let's start with you as one of our educators on the panel, about what priorities you see in this session. Uh, and uh, viewers have noted a variety of things in this uh, area of concern. And we also heard from Representative Pulowski a couple of weeks ago about the declining number of young people attending colleges, uh, declining attendance issues. And of course, uh, we've had some coverage of some issues at the University of Minnesota, which are also of concern. All of that adds up to what kind of priorities do you see for higher education in this session? What would you like to see? The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so I was, I was a high school teacher for many years and often would talk to my students about what it was, how to prepare for what they were going to be ready for after high school. Um, obviously we have PSCO, which allows our students to take college classes while they're still in high school. What I want to be able for me, you know, I think after COVID, education has changed and we have to really be able to grab onto that. We have to seize that moment to be able to look at our system of education and look at what our, edu our educators, our students, and our parents want. And what they want is multiple pathways. So that's what they want. And that doesn't mean that we don't send people to college because college is an important, important thing for people who need it. But we have to acknowledge the fact that not everyone is, is going to want careers that um, require college education. And so being able to have multiple pathways for our students um, is going to be key, especially as we're looking at declining enrollment for traditional, uh, traditional college. So um, I would really love to see how we can um, partner our high schools and our colleges together, along with the businesses, our local community businesses, so that we can offer more authentic experiences, more apprenticeship, more residencies, more hands-on um, uh, areas that they're able to learn from experts in the business, expert in their field that count dually for both high school and for college so that again once they they graduate they have certifications they have a two-year degree they have something that's going to help them be able to um, go and get a job right away which then will allow them to get money 
which then allows them to go ahead to continue their education without the crushing debt of college tuition right now. We know that that is overwhelming. And um, the one way to do that is to, uh, to help with that is to um, structurally change the way that we look at um, school after high school. Senator Rarick, higher education, your thoughts. Yeah, you know, this is a, an issue area that I took on three years ago and I've been digging into, but even uh, the, eight, the eight plus years that I've been here, something I've talked about with my construction background and having gone to a trade school, you know, I'm adamant when I talk to kids that are in high school, they need more than a high school education in today's world, but it, there are a variety of ways uh, to get that education. It could be an apprenticeship program. It could be a two-year program, a four-year program. And um, as Representative Mueller said, uh, and what's actually already happening is, you know, things are changing. Uh, the workforce that we, you know, we talked about that a little earlier is there is such demand for it. And uh, Pine Technical and Community College uh, in my hometown of Pine City, they are already working with a number of companies that company in town, they find somebody, um, they want to bring them on and get them working right away, but they know they need education as well. And, and Pine Tech is developing programs to bring them in. So they're getting that training, but yet they're working during the day or in the evening. Uh, so it is that combination. So they're not only working a job and earning money, but then they're getting some training. And, and I think, uh, you know, our schools are going to have to start looking at that because it's going to move even beyond manufacturing. Um, a lot of places are going to say, hey, we just want to get you here and we'll kind of train you in the specifics, but we still want you to get that four-year degree. So you're going to maybe be seeing some dual paths like that, working and going to school at the same time. Um, and those are things that our universities and colleges are going to have to figure out how to adapt to um, so that we can continue that, uh, meet the workforce, um, and, but still get that education that uh, people want and that companies are expecting. So I think that's a big part of a conversation that's going to happen. And then in that realm too, you know, I think there are things we really, we had a presentation today for the Min State system um, around workforce development, uh, there are still a lot of people out there who no one from their family has ever gone on beyond a high school education and they work in lower uh, wage jobs and they're the ones who really need help through grants and scholarships to be able to be that first one from their family to get to school, so get that training so that they can move into the middle class. So um, those are all things that are, are happening and being talked about in that higher education realm. Senator uh, Swazinski, your thoughts on the higher education issues? Yeah, um, first of all, we have to get rid of the stigma of not going to college. Um, you know, in my years of teaching, I'd run into a senior in the hallway and I'd just go up to him and, hey, what are your plans for next year? And if their head went down, I knew exactly what was going to come out of their mouth. And I don't know how we instilled that that shame in them for only going to Mankato or only going to Hennepin Tech, but that but shame on us. So I'd, I'd say the first place to start is um, not asking our kids, where are you going to college? And asking them, what are your plans for the future? And the other thing I would suggest is um, when I was, okay, back in the dining dinosaur days when I was in college, um, I was able to work part time and pay tuition and rent and <clears throat> um, food and, um, and the legislature used to fund I think 60 to 40 um, to, of the tuition of, of our, our post secondary schools. And now I think we fund it's a 40 to 60 is what I've been told. So I, I would like to work on that. The, the tuition is unacceptable. And, <clears throat> and we've all known about the college loan debts and, and how that's um, stifling families. They can't get um, mortgages for their first home because their college loan debts are, um, are too high. And, and then uh, I just want to, I think it was, I think um, um, Patricia alluded to this, but I can't remember. Um, exactly. But um, I think it might have been our 
committee, Jason, earlier today, or it might have been the other education committee. But I, I found out that there was a, we heard a bill that if you, if a kid works for 350 hours, um, and what we used to call a candy stripe girl, uh, or boy, boys, I guess now too, but for 350 hours of um, work in a, in a, in a elder care facility, or some such facility, they could earn high school credit. And you know, what a great idea to, to help um, with shortages in our, in our, in our in our healthcare system and um, um, turn kids on to the possibility of that being a career path. Representative Feist, your thoughts, higher education. Yeah, thank you. Um, we heard that bill too in the House Education Policy oh. Committee. So hopefully, um, I thought it was a really great idea too. Um, so I have a bill um, that's my partisan bill. I've been working on it with Republican Senator Zach Duckworth. Um, since last term that would require FAFSA completion for high school graduation. Um, it's been done in, I want to say, 13 other states, and um, it has broad exemptions, but basically it's psycho psychology. <laughs> like we're asking people to opt out instead of opting in. And what we know is that um, the most recent data shows that we left about $49 million in Pell Grants on the table that students in Minnesota would have been eligible for. Um, so there are a lot of people who are eligible for federal student aid that don't know it. Um, and we also have data from other states that have done this that have shown that in states that do it, um, low-income students are much more likely to go on directly to higher ed after graduating um, from high school. Um, and I'm working on it with advocates within the two-year community and technical college um, setting um, because they know a lot of these students do go to two-year community and technical colleges. Um, and, and so... Um, Bridging that topic, um, what I would love to see is what they did. I think in Tennessee is the first place, and I think it's a couple other states where they basically just extended the K-12 continuum to include two-year community and technical colleges. Um, and, and they are a great place for us to be training our future workforce because, and I think <laughs> Others have kind of said this too. Um, they're really connected to industry. And so a lot of the students who go there can have direct experience um, with um, facilities and equipment um, that's like really new um, cutting edge technology. Um, so I think that that's great workforce development. I think it's a great investment. And also it's just a great equity thing. Um, getting more students who might not have the funding or um, kind of the momentum to go on to higher ed. Um, I think if we if we require FAFSA and we help pay for those to your community and technical colleges, I think that would be a really great step forward for Minnesota. Yeah. If I could follow right. up on that real quick. Yeah. Right yeah, you know, uh, again, Pine Technical Community College is, is working on that. They partnered with uh, Dennis Franzen. He created a, you know, Franzen Banks. Um, he created a foundation and it started with uh, two schools, one from Webster, Wisconsin, and then Rush City, Minnesota, that any kid who graduates would get free tuition at Pine Tech. Um, what they found out, um, because they had to go through all the other processes, is so they earn, they would qualify for so much aid that he has expanded that, and it's now six schools that he offers that to. So, um, and then Pine County, uh, with some of their ARPA money, has uh, extended that to the other schools in, in Pine County. So, you know, there are ways to really help and get, and that's, I've been trying to get that model out to get other folks uh, in the same situation as a Dennis Franzen or, or others to pool together uh, to really help make that possible for these community colleges and tech <clears throat> colleges because uh, it's a great opportunity for them and, and there is a lot of help to get them there. They just aren't always aware of it. Mm-hmm. It might be worth noting here um, that if you go far enough back into our history, two-year so-called, then so-called vocational schools uh, were in fact connected to their local school district rather than part of the uh, part of the state system. And some of what we're talking about here, um, maybe it's a proof of the old biblical adage, "Nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. We're rediscovering some things perhaps that we knew before. So... That's as close as I get to a policy uh, statement. We'll move on now. Um, <laughs> Senator, Senator Rarick, uh, uh, let's talk, uh, let's move to K-12 education or what I think we now would call pre-K pre uh, education. There's been some action on the uh, uh, bill to provide for um, students uh, being fed at uh, breakfast and lunch at our public schools. There are some other issues that are uh, percolating with respect to uh, 
A12 education. I'm going to keep calling that even though that's inaccurate, but you know, you reach a certain age, you get fixated on things. Senator Rarick, tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening on education issues and what you would like to see happen in the weeks ahead. Yeah, um, you know, I've been having a lot of conversations with superintendents and, and principals, school boards, uh, teachers, parents, um, after becoming lead on uh, education finance. And what I'm hearing repeatedly is uh, money on the formula is their number one priority. Um, and then special education cross subsidy is, is another issue. You know, the federal government has mandated um, these special educations and they said they would fund it to 40 percent. They've They've never come close. Um, and so, you know, I believe the state needs to, to step up and, and help out in that if the federal government is not going to. Um, and then there are things, you know, equalization is, is another piece. Um, a lot of our small property poor districts just don't have the ability to go to their taxpayers uh, for even upkeep or operations. So if we can kind of equalize that out so that when they go to their voters uh, for an operating referendum or, or something, they know that they're going to get assistance from the state to make it affordable. Uh, so they'll still have locals still have to help pay for it, but they'll get a little bit more assistance. Um, you know, so those are some of the top things that I'm hoping we'll uh, talk about. And, you know, also hoping that uh, and we're hearing loud and clear from the superintendents, you know, don't put any more mandates on us right now. Uh, if you give us, say, five and five on the formula, but put a bunch of mandates, that money is gone before we even get to talk about teacher raises or the extra cost for busing. So, you know, those are things that I'll be continuing to talk about in committee. Um, let's be wise with the money. I think people, I, I've heard that repeatedly too. They don't, they don't mind uh, funding um, and having their tax pay tax money come into the state as long as they know we're using it wisely and and I know the, the vast majority of our uh, school districts uh, they use every penny as uh, best they can and we sometimes hear stories uh, that get the news that where that doesn't happen and then people tend to think that every school district is like that I think uh, when you get out and talk to most of these that's not the case um, they're using it uh, as, as best they can um, but you know I'm the, what we just passed, I was not in agreement with that. I would have rather seen it go on the formula or something, but uh, we'll we'll have other discussions around that, I'm sure, as we go forward. But uh, the formula and special education cross-subsidy are my kind of my tier one uh, priorities. Senator Swazinski, uh, K-12, pre-K-12 education. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, reading is constantly uh, the third grade. If we can get all third graders up to a reading level at third grade, we all know that that's in a child and a society's best interest. So we're spending a lot of time in policy and um, finance hearing from the experts on what we can do better in that. I think free meals, uh, The one of the few things I remember from college is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and at the base level was the physiological needs of our students. And, um, and if they go to school hungry, um, they're going to come home from school hungrier. And I think if we can help them out with a, a lunch that is um, – um, that helps them, helps with that physiological need. And speaking of physiological needs, I don't want to steal any of Representative Feist's um, ammunition, but a couple years ago, her and I met with a bunch of young women um, from um, some, some Western suburb schools, and I think some from the South Metro as well. And they talked to us about menstrual equity and period poverty and, and, um, and the, the um, insensitivity activity of of women having uh, and young girls having the um all the issues that they have because we don't supply them with free products in our in our bathrooms and um i listened to that those young women and it just changed my life and i came home and i asked my wife and i about it and she told me things she never we just don't men just don't never heard these stories or I never did. And I found out from my female teaching colleagues that they all keep supplies in their desk drawers. And I'm no 
kid ever came up to me after class and they must just know men just don't know these things or something. I don't know. But I've, the learning curve for me has been incredible. And I'm so grateful for those young women and, and representative Feist for, for, um, on, on, for um, putting that forward in the House. And I'm the chief author in the Senate. And, and I, I just and, and what and, and what Jason to, um, you know, the governor's proposal is four and two on the formula in the next two years. And if we can do five and five and index it for inflation, that would be huge for the schools um, with respect to all the issues and the, the kids' mental health um, cons- um, pre-COVID and certainly since COVID, and not just for our students, but for our, our the teachers as well and the staff. Um, a lot of suffering is going on in our schools right now, and I'd, I'd really like to, us to address some of those things as well. Representative Feist, your thoughts? Yeah, so... Um... A couple of years ago, I became obsessed with this thing called compensatory revenue, um, which is a part of the education budget. It's 8.1% of the full education budget. Um, for this biennium, it's $763 million. Um, that goes to schools to um, target students who are underprepared to learn and who are not meeting academic standards. Um, and the proxy that we use to calculate compensatory revenue is free and reduced lunch forms. Um, but those are going away because we are going to provide universal meals. So it creates a really tricky mathematical and practical challenge for ensuring that we're adequately um, and strategically funding our school systems. Um, so I have been working on a formula to update the compensatory revenue um, to make sure that we continue to fund at the current levels and also that we are accurately um, reaching all of the students who should be generating that revenue but won't um, be providing that green reduced lunch form anymore. Um, so I'm not really a math person, but I've be kind of become a math person over this one bill. Um, and Patricia can can attest I'm obsessed with compensatory revenue and I, I've presented the bill in like a lot of granular detail. Um, but I I think it's uh, it's obviously really important. I think it requires a lot of conversations um, with each other, um, like across bodies and across the aisle and with the governor. And also like today, I met with the superintendent um, out in Egan. Um, anybody who wants to meet with me, I just kind of try to talk to as many people as possible just to kind of understand the practical um, and strategic questions about how to like create a formula. Because any decision we make, even if it's like a tiny percentage, when you're talking about that many hundreds of millions of dollars, like every little tweak has really like a huge ripple effect. Um, so, um, so that's something I'm obsessed with. It's like my mission for this session um, is to update that formula. Um, so general public, if people have ideas, email me. Um, and, and I'd love to chat. Um, and then as Senator Swazinski mentioned, um, uh, I am also really, really proud of the work that we've done together to address period poverty in our schools um, because students miss a school on a regular basis because they can't afford period products. Um, and the cost of addressing chronic absenteeism is much higher than the cost of just providing these prod- products for free. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And also just the fact that students brought it to us Um, means a lot. Um, The way I discovered it was because a 15-year-old student came to me and now she's like testifying at the UN. (laughs) She's like a high achiever. Um, But um, but yeah, so it's been a really, it's been a really inspiring um, bill to be working on. Um, And this is just an area of of great passion and high importance. So I'm excited to talk about it. I'll stop talking now. (laughs) I can keep going. Representative uh, Representative Mueller, your thoughts? K-12 education. Yeah, thank you. Um, The benefit of going last is being able to kind of figure out what I want to say and who I want and to how to respond. Um, So I, uh, being a teacher for almost 20 years, I have lots of connections into our school districts and um, I have been uh, very um, open with my with my superintendents about uh, things that I how I, what their priorities are and listening to them. Uh, similar to what Senator Rarick was talking about, um, making sure that they have more money on this formula. Here, here's the thing, is that all the other parts that we've been talking about, a lot of the money that is is um, in our school districts are often restricted 
restricted and don't go to the classroom, don't go to students, don't go to teachers. And so that's something that we need to be able to, um, to change. We have to be able to give unrestricted money to our school districts to honor the school uh, board um, members who have been elected by their local school districts and honor them so that they can make decisions for their communities. Having mandates is very difficult. And I get um, emails by my superintendents and principals all the time about how even if you're going to be paying for this, this is still money that we could be spending on things like raising teacher salaries, on literacy, on um, all those other different options that we've been listening to. Of course, our special education cross subsidy funding has to be front and center, as Senator Rarick said. And, you know, some of the other, when we talk about literacy, um, I was one of the um, representatives that spoke very passionately at our um, press conference. And part of it is because we need to make sure that we are um, dedicating our um, our resources to the science of reading. We have too long been um, using a failed system of whole re of whole literacy or balanced literacy, and this is not working. And it is resulted into the um, to the statistics that you heard Senator Swazinski um, share. Uh, over half of our third graders are not reading at grade level. It's unacceptable. It is a healthcare crisis. It's a public safety crisis, and it's a crisis that requires us to respond. Now. Now, and that means we have to be able to hold fast to the science of reading, and that's really important. You know, we think about some of these um, other policies that you heard from them, and many people are able to do this already at the local level. Um, I think about um, the bill that I was so I was so happy that um, Representative Feist brought the bill to us about period poverty. But even in the old own testimony, we heard about how local school districts are already are already addressing this. In Austin, we have people who um, understand that there are um, students that are struggling with this because of where they are in, in, in life and, and where their family is in life. And um, our, our local school district and local community often um, donate these items. As a matter of fact, we have people who, who run what we call the Packer Pantry, and um, all they have to do is, is send out an email and our community just it floods that with resources. And so we are seeing how our local school districts are able to um, respond to these needs in a way that is going to be unique to their own communities. And so um, really excited to to be able to still advocate for our school districts to make sure that they have the, the money going where they need to go that is unrestricted so that we can honor our local school districts and um, allow them to respond to what they see in their local communities. So Representative Feist, I just wanna go back to you for just a second to talk about the formula issue. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, has there been any discussion on what should replace free and reduced school lunches as a measure of um, the need for support in a particular district? And if so, what would that look like? Or is this something that's going to be determined in future sessions? Yeah, so you're asking me to get into the weeds, so you've been warned. Um, so <clears throat> so right now, um, what we're doing We'll is drag you out of the weeds with... if, it gets, if we get yeah. too deep. But anyway, go ahead. It just is like mind falling asleep if you get really bored. Um, so right now we're, we're relying a lot on Medicaid direct certification, um, which is something that runs through the Department of Education, that they have access to that data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so um, what we learned in November is that we thought that was capturing about 90 percent on average of the students who would be eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, and so initially in my bill, what I did is I tried to capture that last 10 percent. Um, but we know that it's not even across all school districts in terms of how much uh, that Medicaid direct certification is capturing. Um, so, for example, I believe in like Columbia Heights, one of my school districts, I think that misses about 27 percent of the kids who should be generating this funding. And so what we did is we um, 
we did like a little bit of a multiplier. So we boosted um, based on the Medicaid direct certification number. And then we also added weight for ELL numbers, English language learners, and also high mobility students. And the reason we did that is that these students are typically the students that we want to target with this funding. And it also is data that is already available because um, some of the other options would involve <laughs> schools getting more forms. And we were like trying to get away from any type of forms. We wanted to make it administratively easy for schools. Um, we learned through um, like a week or so ago, the Department of Education released new data, and it looks like the Medicaid direct certification isn't quite as accurate as we had thought. And so um, I'm having more conversations about, you know, mathematically we could get it up, but I, the, the variation among school districts is pretty significant. And so I don't want to do something that's like mathematically easy, but isn't um, really strategic and targeting students adequately. Um, so I was just talking with the superintendent from Egan this afternoon, and he had some ideas that are kind of math based, kind of specific to the school district, and is trying to find that, that accurate, administratively easy um, so, option. So we could replace. So, so we could describe it, we could describe it maybe as a work in progress, at least at this point. It is, but I feel like I have I have um, considered and rejected a lot of options. So while while there are, while it is a work in progress, I think we're really coming we're, we're really honing it and and we have new information, new data, and so we're just going to continue to hone it. But um, but I feel really good about where we're at. All right. Well, we'll we'll leave that highly technical but really important issue, maybe for some future discussion with. Uh, uh, our uh, future guests. We have a viewer who has reminded us that we've spent very little time over the last few weeks talking about transportation. We have about five minutes left. Let's start with you, Senator, uh, Senator Swazinski. Tell us a little bit about where you see transportation going uh, in this session. Wow. Um, I'm not on transportation committee, so I'm going to start with that. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm going to talk about 212, right? Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, uh, six, seven years ago when I got elected, Southwest Light Rail was like a, a cool thing, and it was going to happen, and it was going to be uh, under budget, wink, wink, and um, and finished by 2022, and then it's just been uh, a, a, just, a, a, you know, cost overruns. It's going to be twice as what it was expected to cost. It's not going to be done, I don't think, now until 2027. Um, and it's just been just a horrible thing for the Southwest Metro and for the whole state. It's the largest like, works project in the history of Minnesota. So I, I want to get it right. I know the, uh, the auditor's report um, has come out. There's going to be, I believe, more dealing with what we've done wrong because we want to get public transit right and I think we're going to learn a lot of valuable lessons from the mistakes we've made and and the people in Minnesota will benefit but for right now um it's it's we got a lot of uh, reading to find out what went wrong Senator Rarick transportation uh, we got to get back to focusing on uh, fixing roads and bridges. If you are driving around uh, St. Paul, you see potholes, and uh, I think they got to come up with a new name because they're uh, far bigger than I've ever seen before. So, um, you know, I, it's been a, an issue. I served on transportation a few years ago, and it was something we talked about. The the Highway User Transportation Fund uh, is being used for a lot of administration. Um, that's something that is a problem. Uh, that funding all needs to go into roads. And, you know, we all know the gas tax is uh, kind of a dying source. Uh, so, you know, I've been supporting the full um, using sales taxes from auto parts and, and leases and all of that, 100% uh, to go into transportation to, to fund our roads. So um, that's, that's where I would want to see transportation issues going. Representative Mueller, your thoughts on transportation? Yeah, thank you so much. You have to remember that having a, 
a, a safe and effective infrastructure such as roads and bridges is a core function of government and any type of uh, type of funding that we do um, is exponentially or any type of policy is exponentially felt um, out in uh, the rural area we have not only do we have cars but we also have you know I guess similar to the urban areas they have all these uh, you know buses and other things but we have tractors and other other heavy equipment that is uh, using the same using the roads as well so making sure that we have funding but it's also balanced funding so that we're able to have our our roads and bridges out here and also to remember that we need to have a balanced approach when it comes to energy and especially when it comes to transportation it is not feasible for us to think that um, our outstate members are going to be able to just suddenly go to electric cars and that's something that has been was something that was very concerning to many of my members as we were looking at the bill that would require green um, require everything to be um, electric or, or non petroleum in by 40, uh, 2040. And so we just need to make sure that we have a good and balanced approach and that our funding is, is balanced as well. All I'll say on the pothole problem is I nominate 7th Street in St. Paul as a, a place to begin the pothole fixing projects. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a piece of my axle in one of those potholes. Uh, Representative Feist, uh, transportation issues. The floor is yours. You're going to be, uh, you get to bat last and you'll be our uh, our last commentator of the evening. The floor is yours. Great, thanks. Um, so, so I'm just going to get really granular. Um, the things I'm most interested in in transportation are Highway 65 um, and Central Avenue, which um, impact my district. And so, I'm just want to say thanks to MnDOT that has been really collaborative and and detailed in trying to like address safety issues, just access issues, and just making. Um, the the roads safe and accessible and pleasant to, to drive on and to be a pedestrian on. Um, so so I do think we need to be looking at transportation from a multimodal perspective. So from a pedestrian perspective, biking, walking paths, uh, our roads and our mass transit. Uh, what is the status of the transportation bill at, the, at this moment? Does can anybody provide us any guidance on that? There is going to be a mass bill sure. of some sort before the legislative session ends, correct? Yeah. No, there's no so. targets yet, so I'm sure they're working on it, but it's a little ways out. All right, very good. I'm going to thank our panelists this evening for a broad and deep discussion on the important issues that are facing the people of the state of Minnesota. I want to remind our viewers that uh, we'll be back with you next week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature goes home, uh, unraveling the mysteries of St. Paul. And I also want to remind you again of the Minnesota Channel on a nightly basis. Thank you and good evening. Your Legislators is made possible by Minnesota Corn. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in value-added products. Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at mfu.org.